We've been blessed with some uh, really good attorneys uh, um, here today. They came to give you a presentation on uh, uh, what do you just want to call this? Uh, information on gun laws is perfect to carry. No, there you go. There you go. They're going to do a presentation and they're also going to be available for a question and answer. So if you got something weighing on you, you can just go, you can just go ahead and go ahead and ask for it. I'll tell you, you know, we used to, uh, we had an attorney that we referred for many years, uh, Mr. Mark Barris. And those of you that are older students of mine, you know, you know about, you know, that deal. And he's really good to us for a while. And, and you know, now he's, I'm not sure if he's running for a judge or anything to do, but he's not taking new cases no more. And so I had to, so I had to go ahead and start the hunt for some new talent. And I tell you, we dug and dug and dug. And we came up with these fine folks here, uh, Hillary and Joe. And, uh, uh, you know, we sat them down for a, for a lunch and we grilled them on a, uh, on some questions and some scenarios and what they would do and how they would how they would do this and how they would do that and I tell you what boy they had the answers these guys are some smart folks and I tell you what you know um, you know down the road you know if you had, end up having a uh, insurance program like Golden or something like that you call that uh, one eight hundred number um, they're going to put in a call to these guys these guys are going to be the ones representing them. Here's some smart folks, you know. Joe, I had sent you an email the other day. I said, wow, man, you're looking sharp. Because guess what? About every other day, I was turning on TV, and there was Joe getting interviewed on one of these big cases. So, you know, they're just smart folks, and uh, they try some big cases. And uh, when stuff's going down, uh, they come and interview these folks, and they really know what's going on. they got a background in, in this type of defense. And, uh, you know, as you know, and as I told you, I, I would not recommend anybody. I would not use myself. So we're proud to have them. So I'll hand it over to you. So. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, here's what we're going to do. The reason why uh, we thought about doing this uh, is twofold. One is because obviously Mike came to us and a gentleman named John Wargo, and uh, and then and then second is there is always confusion about gun laws in our society, and the reason for that is we have three layers. Sure, we have three layers of laws. That's okay, can you yeah, turn it up? Uh, maybe the last one. There we go. You got that? No? No, that's not working. No, there we go. You had a sub button before. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'll just keep talking. There we go. which is the federal law. And the federal law is some of the most confusing law you're going to find because nothing is ever quite defined. The reason for that is you've got 50 states plus territories plus federal districts, and then you've got obviously Congress writing the laws. After that, we have state laws. So you've got 50 different state laws. And after that, you have local municipal laws and or sheriff's departments. And the reason why that gets confusing is, as you know, and I'm sure many of you are permit to carry holders. Yeah, it turns out that I got it. So <laughs> many of you are permit to carry holders. That's judged based on the sheriff's department for each county. So you got 87 counties, you could have 87 different rules. Okay, so what we'd like to go through, this keeps going off, it's fine. Tell, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's cool. So what we'd like to go through, and maybe we could kill like the light right over here. We just want to go over some basic laws on gun rights. And that's great. So why don't you the first one? The first one is the purchase and possession of firearms. And we just thought we'd just have some fun. So the purchase and possession of firearms, basically it's this. Let's take a federal licensed person. Federal licensed person, as you can see, uh, you have to be age of 18 or older, and you have to get a license to do that. Obviously, with private sales, that is not necessary. Private sales basically goes back to state law. So what is state law in private sales? If I sell a firearm to Hillary, Hillary is over 18 years of age, she doesn't have a, you know, some type of criminal problem. She's not an ineligible person. I can sell her a firearm. I don't have to license that. The only exception to that are the assault rifles. So this isn't going to cover your handguns, your shotguns, but any of the ARs, right. AKs. Just, and it's good, 
it's good policy just to fill out the transfer permit because that way you're not going to get in any trouble. It's right. just that's good policy to do that. So if you're doing a private sale, gun show, or regular private individual to individual, um, you don't have to have the license. You do have to abide by some other rules, which is, is that in Minnesota, depending upon your age, we'll go to the next one. Oh, next slide. Yep. So, under, no permit is required to transfer guns, private, private. Those who wish to buy a semi-automatic military style assault weapon, that's a little different. You do have to get the license. And you could also apply, if you're a federal dealer, for a one-time buyer's application. And you could use that for up to the five days. Next. Now, private sales. The private sale, just what I'm talking about here, is you don't have to have a license. So obviously, again, with that example, I can sell a firearm to Hillary, she can send one to me, um, as long as she's not a prohibited person and it's not some type of an assault rifle. If, there's one caveat, if you knowingly sell a firearm to someone who is ineligible as a straw purchase, that you're gonna get in trouble for. So if you know someone is a felon, someone has a felony, burglary, robbery on their record, and of course they're not allowed to possess a firearm, but you sell it to them knowingly, that's going to get you into trouble whether it's a private sale or not. Next. So, who can possess? All right, so obviously violent criminals, state and federal laws, who has been convicted of a violent felony? Now, here's where again things get a little, a little confusing. What we all think of as a violent felony is something where someone gets hurt, or there's a threat of violence, or there's a weapon used. But under both state and federal law, crime of violence is expanded to also include drug crimes, and it has always been that way. So if you've got some 18-year-old kid who makes the mistake while he's in school or wherever of selling you know, some marijuana to somebody else, that's a felony. You can't sell marijuana even if it's, you know, a small amount, you know, 20 grams. You can't do that. So that would be a felony and it would be considered a violent felony, even though there's no violence with it, which would kick in this law, which means that you can't possess a firearm. Now, before we go on, there is a way that you could try to get around this, and rightfully so. It's not some excuse. It's something that people should utilize. If you do have, because you made a mistake and you have a drug felony, and you've completed probation, you've done your three years of probation, five years of probation, everything's fine, you know, everything else in your life is fine, and you want to be able to possess a firearm again. What we do in our office, and attorneys could do this, is you could have a petition to the court to reinstate your firearm rights. So if you had, 10 years ago, some mistake of you know some low-level drug felony and you wish to get your firearm rights back you can petition to do that in state court and that would also apply to federal law and just to add to that so the standard of review for the court on one of these petitions is whether you can establish that you have good cause so I've done these petitions before, and it's helpful, especially with the drug offenses, to have people attest that, you know, this was in your past, that you've since been sober, that you went to treatment, that you have a family, that you've been educated. The more you can show that you have done since this felony happened, the more likely it is that a court is going to find good cause. And it's definitely helpful to have affidavits from friends, families, coworkers, the, the more you provide, the more likely it will be for one of these to be granted, in my experience. And that's correct, because sometimes what we'll see in our practice is a young person made a mistake, and then now they're 27, 28 years old, they want to go hunting again with their family, they want to do something, uh, with, whether it's shooting, or they want to participate and they want to exercise their right to a firearm. So, and that's where you can do that petition to try to get your firearm rights back. And usually done with the way Hillary has said it's done is successful. So, who else? Well, if you have a mental health issue such as, and this is really the only example that you're going to run into, if you have been, say, committed for a mental health problem, 
um, what does that mean? That's when the county steps in and says, hey, you're a danger to yourself or others for whatever the mental health issue is, and they start commitment proceedings. Something like that is going to bar you. Just having, if someone goes to therapy, if someone has an issue with depression, if someone has some other personal issue where they're receiving some type of therapeutic services, no, of course not. That's not going to bar you. Basically, the only thing that we have seen is when you have something like you have been committed because of mental health issues that you would be a danger to yourself or others. So far, any questions about sale and purchases of firearms? And you can interrupt us anytime and we'll try to answer any questions. Yes, sir. What if you uh, purchased an uh, assault rifle from a brother? You still have to go through the... Uh, yes, the assault rifles. The question is, what happens if you purchase an assault rifle from your brother, friend, private seller? <coughs> yes, you should get the federal license for that. Yes. Yep? The first slide, there was a couple of lines in there that I couldn't read. It had to do with the age of you know, a minor. Oh, um, sure. Maybe you could read them and then... Yep, I can get it right here. Here's what it is. When you have a, in Minnesota, if you, okay, what happens is this, in Minnesota, if you are within a municipality, you, here's what the law is, anyone under the age of 18, under federal license, you have to, you can't possess the firearm. Under Minnesota law, the minimum age to, per, to purchase a firearm uh, without a person's parent or permission is 18 years of age. However, you can, outside of the municipality, have a legal age of 14. So that's what that is. So if you're living in, um, you know, in rural Minnesota, you could purchase with your parents' permission, of course, a firearm is 14 <coughs> years of age. You have to have your, it's more a doing to possession, not purchase. Right. Um, in order to possess a firearm at the age of 14, you have to have your parents' permission and your parents' presence. Okay, what about, uh, in my case, I inherited a 22 rifle, my aunt, and it's kind of a keepsake, but I want to pass it on to one of the grandkids. They're under 18. What provisions or what? Two things. How he, the gentleman asked, he wants to take basically firearms that have been in his family for years, and he wants to pass it to his grandchildren. How old are the grandchildren, and where do they live? Well, the youngest is five. Okay. <laughs> you couldn't do that. Yeah, so, I mean, no. so, so basically, if more, more than likely, probably a 12-year-old, okay. you know, and they, you know. Uh, Dakota County. Yeah, that's going to have to get parent permission and can't directly go to the 12 year old. If they're 14 and up, yes. As long as the parents have permission, you can give it to them. But I can't give it to the 12 year old. Not the 12 year old. Yes. Can it be put into a trust? Possible. No, somebody has to. I see what you're saying. The other gentleman asked, can you put a firearm into a trust? You can put money and property normally into a trust. That is correct. But somebody has to manage the trust. So where would the firearm be? With real property in a trust, like a house or a farm, well, it's there. There's no way of moving it. Same thing with a car. If you put a car as property in a trust, there would have to be someone that takes care of it. So it would all depend. Yes, the ownership of property could be in a trust, but that physical property has to be held by someone, and they would have to be a legal person to do that. So trust would not be a way to get around what the age requirements are in an eligible person. Yes? What's the present definition for an assault? Well, assault weapon is defined under federal law, and that's going to be anything that has, well, it's not a it's not a long barrel, it's not a shotgun, it's not a handgun, so it's by exemption. The exact definition, I don't exactly know. Mm -hmm. It's by exclusion. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was different 20 years ago, must have been, because I've been a transfer uh, uh, SKS into my daughter, and mm -hmm. they, I asked the state, and they said uh, there's no such thing as a transfer, you just sell it to her, and there was no way of transfer. 20 years ago. Yeah, no, that's, that's different today. And that's the problem with the federal law. Um, and what we could do is, we, if anybody wants an exact question answered, 
Come up to us afterwards, give us your name and email and what your question is, and we'll provide an answer the best that we can. Uh, but normally, the firearms for the uh, automatic weapons obviously would be an assault-type rifle. The, if it's not automatic, then it's not assault-type rifle, except there are some different provisions, and, and I'd have to get back to you on those. What are the questions, though, so far on the possession? Okay, and as we go along, if you have any questions, just let us know. You can interrupt any time. So the permit to carry. Oh, um, I would imagine most people here have a permit to carry or in the process of getting one, I would imagine. Okay, so let's go on with that. Now, when you get for a permit to carry, what the statute basically says under 624 is the following. And I won't go through all of them, and we can send you our slide presentation online, not a problem. But it, basically, it's this. You go to your sheriff's department, and you apply, $100 fee, I think it is, and you have to fill out and give information on all these areas. So what are those? You have to have training and safe use, complete the application, at least 21 years old, citizen or permanent resident, and then you're not a prohibited person. And again, what's a prohibited person? Somebody who's been convicted of a felony and has not had their rights restored. Or somebody who's been convicted of a domestic assault. And here's a little bit different in the domestic assault realm. If you have a conviction for actual domestic assault, whether that is physical harm, punch, slap, kick, whatever it is, or fear of bodily harm, that means you put another person in fear that they were going to be injured. That will prohibit you under federal and state law. Under state law, and this is where the confusing thing happens, you will see in Minnesota statutes that it says after a three-year period of time, you can get your uh, rights back with a domestic assault conviction. That is state law. Under federal law, and there's all different cases with the different circuits, do not count on them. This is the one area, sort of like with the assault weapon question, that when clients come to us, we give them opinions as to what is the most recent interpretation of the Violence Against Women Act, which happened, I think it was back in 1996. And what occurs with that is it all is going to depend if it was a conviction for domestic assault in state court, or could it be something else, like disorderly conduct. If it was disorderly conduct, you're fine. If it was domestic assault, that's the gray area. And the federal law regarding these domestic assault convictions is harsh. So it's a lifetime ban. In Minnesota, it says three years, but it's a lifetime ban under the federal law. Furthermore, even though you can do a petition for restoration of gun rights on these violent felonies, guess what? You cannot do them on domestic assaults. So a domestic assault is a lifetime prohibition. Guess what? Expungement doesn't work to get rid of this. Unless you can get a court to overturn the original conviction, which is extremely difficult to do, and expungement's not going to do you any good under the federal law. Basically, the only way to undo one of these domestic assault convictions for these lifetime prohibitions is to get a freaking pardon. And those, I'm sure, if anyone's been looking into that issue, are exceedingly rare and exceedingly difficult. So domestic assault is a big deal, and Minnesota state law doesn't make it seem as much of a big deal as it is. But it's important, it's probably the most important thing to remember as someone who has relationships and wants to have guns, is you've got to be very careful not to get one of these convictions. And that's correct. And if you... And you could Google this, it was in the Star Tribune back in 1997, I think it was. Uh, when Congress passed the uh, Violence Against Women Act, what they didn't realize was, like many times Congress passes something, is uh, they don't realize how the law will be interpreted and executed. And what happened was, uh, people didn't realize when that act was originally passed, that someone with just a domestic assault conviction, even after probation is over, even after everything's done, would have a lifetime ban. And I believe in 1997, there were uh, at least four Minneapolis police officers that had to go back to district court to what Hillary was saying, reopen their case and get it dismissed. Because if you do get your case reopened and then get it dismissed, there's no longer a ban. 
And again, with, with uh, disorderly conducts, that's fine. You don't have to worry about the ban with that. And I've been doing a lot of research on this, so I have a lot to add on this. For the domestic assault convictions, there's no exception if you're a peace officer. So for the violent felonies, there's an exception if you're a peace officer. You can still possess a firearm. Not so with the domestic assaults. Also, there's certain dispositions available in district court in Minnesota that sound like a great deal. So there's something called a stay of adjudication. So on a stay of adjudication, you plead guilty, but the judge doesn't accept your plea, so there's never any conviction. Well, guess what? Under federal law, there's a conviction. So even a stay of adjudication on a domestic assault can cause federal problems. And um, there's some case law out there since the Lautenberg Amendment, which it's called, that's been trying to clarify these issues, but it is such a gray area. So it's just something to be aware of. Sometimes people will call us and they will ask us, well, that scenario, I had an attorney, I had a domestic assault, and the judge said it was a stay of adjudication. Adjudication means when a judge says, I accept your plea or I accept the finding of the jury and you are adjudicated guilty. If an adjudication is stayed under state law, there is no conviction because a judge made it never adjudicated you guilty. Under federal law, there still is a conviction. So when clients come to us and say, hey, this is what happened five years ago with this other attorney, why can't I still get a gun? That's what we have to explain to them. Now that's different then what's called a continuance for dismissal. If anybody here has had speeding tickets and you go to court, attorney or not, and you talk to the municipal prosecutor, many times he or she will say, well, you know, it's a speeding ticket. I'm gonna continue this for dismissal for a year, pay a fee of 100, 200 bucks, and in a year it'll be dismissed. That will work in federal law. So if you have a domestic assault, where you go to court and you're able to negotiate with the prosecutor that for the next year, as long as everything's fine, there's no conviction, there's no plea of guilt, uh, it just gets dismissed in a year, that's fine under federal law. Now the other thing is with the stalking and judicial control over how long a person cannot possess a firearm. So again, this is all part of if you wanted a permit to carry and you go there and say the sheriff says, well, you were convicted of stalking. And the judge in that case said, lifetime ban or 10-year ban. So I can't do anything with you. Uh, that is correct. Under the stalking and harassment laws, a judge, district court judge, has the power to also issue an order at the time of sentencing that says you can't possess a firearm for a certain period of time. The reason why we tell you this is it's, a, it's not that common that a judge does that, but you will see it. We see it in Minneapolis and St. Paul a little bit, not so much in Outstate, but it's something to be aware of because if you don't know that ahead of time through your attorney going through the litigation, that could be something that could be a problem. So when you go to the permit to carry, as long as you're not a prohibited person, you're 21, everything is fine, um, you're not listed in any type of gang, you don't, you know, you're, you haven't been investigated for being part of the Crips or Bloods or whatever it is. Did you hit next? Oh yeah. You do the application, um, the basic training, obviously you guys know what that is with the basic training, um, and then it has to be certified and then a sheriff must accept the training. Normally that's not a problem, especially with an organization like this, but it has to be proper training. Now, there is, and can you go to the next one? This is basically um, what the applicant has to put down. But one thing, and this goes to something uh, recently that's been in the press is, there is part of the statute on permit to carry that allows the sheriff's department to say, Issuing this could be a danger to the public. And that's a very gray area. And it's not used a lot, but you will, I think you'll be aware of this case. Recently, within the last month, uh, there's a, uh, a male in Fridley, Minnesota, uh, who has been under investigation by the FBI for quite a while for um, posting on ISIS and uh, radical Muslim websites. 
He doesn't have any convictions, I believe, except like some speeding tickets. And he applied through the Anoka County Sheriff's Department to get a permit to carry. And he and the Sheriff's Department are basically litigating this going head to head. So that is going to be a very interesting case because the way the Sheriff's Department is going to proceed, and I don't have anything to do with the case, but just our knowledge of the law, the way the Sheriff's Department is going to have to proceed is to say, look, I still want to deny you this permit to carry because of everything that the FBI has been investigating you for, and that could be a danger to the public. I believe that's what they're going to do. When that happens, the lawsuit starts, it eventually percolates up to district court, court of appeals, and who knows, maybe even Minnesota Supreme Court. But in the next year to 18 months, we're going to see what happens with that provision. If the courts uphold that provision, that person would be denied to have a permit to carry. If they don't uphold that provision, well then he'll be allowed to have a permit to carry with a fire. Any questions so far on the permit to carry? Yeah? After that point, does it become law? Excuse me? After that point, does it become law? Or that you mean the court? Yes, what happens is when, here's how basically the court system works. After the legislature, writes a law and the governor signs off on it, that becomes law of the land in the state. If the law is challenged by any of us, we go to district court, whether it's Rice County, Goodyear, doesn't matter, and say, I'm challenging this law because I have a right to do this and the law says I don't, or for whatever reason. And then the court interprets the law. If the law is interpreted as being unconstitutional or what's called unconstitutionally vague, then that law is stricken or part of the law is stricken. So say the Court of Appeals in the Fridley man's case says, that's too vague. We don't think uh, that just being under investigation should wipe out your criminal, your right to possess a firearm. Uh, then the court would strike out that one provision. The rest of the statute, 624, would exist. It would still be enforced. But that part of the provision of whether the sheriff deems you to be a public safety risk, basically, would be wiped out. Um, I don't, I think that's going to, I think in the end the friendly man is going to lose because I think when a district court has credible evidence that somebody has been investigated for being affiliated allegedly with terrorist groups, I mean, I, I think he's going to lose that one. But, mm -hmm. Any other questions on the permits to carry? Yeah, oh, this is just the rest of it. Completed and signed application, um, state ID or driver's license. And what the partner expungement is, that's what Hillary was talking about before. A, uh, here's the difference between pardon and expungement. A pardon from the governor means you are absolved of anything you were convicted of. So if you were convicted of a uh, third degree drug crime 10 years ago, and our governor today is Governor Dayton. If he pardons you, you, do, you no longer have that conviction. Under federal law, a president, President Trump, has the power to pardon federal offenses. So if you have a state conviction of a drug crime, and the president, whoever he is at the time, says, I want to pardon you, they can't do the state crime. They can only do federal. So if you have a federal conviction, yes, the president can pardon you on that, but not a state. Oh, and just an issue on pardons in Minnesota that came up recently for me is that um, Minnesota isn't pardoning violent felonies right now. Um, I had a friend who got extremely close to it and was basically told that um, it might not always be like this, but the people on the, the pardon board are not pardoning violent felonies in Minnesota right now. So that's not really a great way to get around right. some of this just right. um, before you wanted to submit some application for pardon. It's it's not going to work right now on violent felonies. And pardons are always a long shot. Your, better, your best way of trying to get rid of some conviction is to do an expungement. And we do expungements too, quite a bit of them. And what those are about is basically you have to, you go through a legal process, takes about six to nine months of petitioning the court and asking that your conviction be eliminated. And there's a number of grounds that you have to go through in order to do it. And then law enforcement agencies, prosecutor offices, the BCA, they're all allowed to have input into your petition. Uh, most of the time, we haven't received any objections because they've been pretty clear. 
But if you do go for an expungement and the BCA says, I think we're going to object on this one, they do have the power to do that. And then it goes to court. So the application fee, $100. Um, and then you're going to get your permit to carry. OK, <coughs> so the, the biggest thing that happens with permits to carry is we get questions about, all right, well, I'm walking into a uh, Barber shop, nail salon, whatever it is, there's a sign on the door and it says no firearms. I didn't see it, I walked in, so on and so forth. Um, if it's just something like that, that's not the end of the world. It's a petty misdemeanor under the statutes. Where trouble could happen is if it goes into an area that is totally not permitted, um, such as churches can totally say they're not permitted. Um, this is an area where and we don't know how the sheriff's departments will be interpreting that in terms of revoking your permit to carry. Normally for a petty misdemeanor, there's no revocation for a permit to carry. But if you go in to a government building, say, that's automatically a felony. If you go into a jail, like some people have asked us, well, I have a permit to carry, I keep it on me, I'm a carpenter, um, can I go and work on the Sally Port of a jail in outstate Minnesota. No, you cannot. You better keep that gun at home because if you do work, even if it's just on the outside of the Sally Port as you're driving in because there was a malfunction of the doors and you can fix it, do not have your gun with you because that's going to be at a correctional facility. So, the carry issues. Go ahead. Motor vehicle. This is another one. Um, we get calls about, oh, I'm sorry. There's one on federal buildings. Is the uh, post office considered? I mean, I know yeah. that signs, but is that considered? That's federal. That's federal. That's okay. federal. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you also have to watch out with federal buildings. Um, sometimes people don't realize that there are there's more than two federal courthouses in Minnesota and uh, federal probation offices. The main ones are obviously the one on, that's downtown Minneapolis and downtown St. Paul. But there are federal offices in Fergus Falls, Duluth, Rochester. Now, most of the time, they're pretty well, you know, they tell you right up front, this is a federal office or facility. So, but anything federal, yeah. Mm -hmm. Follow up on that. The only time I've heard a parking lot you can't is a, a post office. Right. The federal, in your car. See, that's just it. Under the federal rules, well, as we have seen it interpreted, don't drive in a federal parking lot with a gun. Okay, state it's different, okay, because if you are, say you have the church, you're going to, you know, Salem Lutheran <laughs> Church, whatever it is, uh, don't walk in that building with the firearm, but if the gun is properly stored in the vehicle, that's different, that's different. That goes for schools too. And that goes for schools too. The feds are, they're, they're, they are sticklers with their rules, so that's why... Don't even think about it on a federal property, but with state, yes, don't enter the facility, but keep it properly stored. There was a question over here, too, was it? Oh, yeah, gentleman in the back. Well, what do you consider it properly stored now? Right, and here's it, here it is. Okay, so proper storage. Basically, it's this. Take the gun, unload the gun, put it in a case, gunny sack, whatever it is, away from the passenger compartment. That's the best thing to do. Um, whether it's in the back of your truck, or it's in the trunk, or it's in the hatchback, whatever it is, keep it as best as you can away from any person. If you do that, you're going to be fine, okay? Where people run into trouble is the gun is loaded, and yes, it's in a box, but the box is under someone's seat. That's not good. You're always going to run into trouble with that. But if you unload it, take the clip out, and then put it in a bag and put it in the trunk, hatchback, or back of the truck. You're going to be fine. What about a motorcycle? Well, motorcycle, you could, if you had a side bag or something, yeah. I mean, put it because the motorcycle is, you could have a bag on your motorcycle. You could have a trunk space. You could have under your seat. What we have seen problems with with motorcycles is um, someone doesn't have a permit to carry, but they keep like a little pouch on the side of the, you know, you can put a pouch on the side of your bike or the tank, you can do that, and that's where they've kept it. 
I've seen problems with that. Um, I've also seen problems with people in the vehicle. They don't have a permit to carry, but they think that just putting the gun in the glove box and taking out the clip is enough. That's not good. Yep. Yeah. No, the school is fine. Don't go in the building with the gun. So, uh, yes, unless there's a sign that says no in the parking lot either. So it's going to depend on the school. For instance, um, like if all of a sudden your, your child is going to whatever elementary school and you don't have to park on their grounds. You can park right on the public street. Leave the gun there. Go get your child. If it is the parking lot and there's no sign saying you can't have a firearm in the parking lot, that's fine. If you're in the school, that's different. That's always going to be a no. Mm -hmm. Oh, two, go ahead. The first. Similar to the school in a federal building with a post office, if I park on a public uh, street, I can have my weapon. Totally correct. Yeah. Feds are no parking lot situation. If it's federal property, it's federal property, don't drive on it. Right. Gentlemen, back to me. The light parks around me, all the parks are like. Well, a, the park, two things. If the park says no firearms, you've got to abide by that. If the park does not say that, and there's no municipal law saying you can't have a gun on park property, you're fine. I don't know what the park rules are here. Um, and remember, there are different parks. You could have a municipal park, county level, town level. You could have a county park. You could have a state park, and then you could have a federal park. Um, so you got to... Know the rules on that. Generally, generally speaking, is what's taught in the in the permit to carry classes is fed, federal's just off limits. Whether it's a, park, a building, a parking lot, it doesn't matter if it's federal. <laughs> um, you know, state generally uh, speaking is fine within the statute that we have posted in the book. It's just you better not be. If you're going to go down the state park property here, you're camping and riding a horse. That's one thing. But you better not have a handful of bunny rabbits, right? You know, I might say something about that. <laughs> But otherwise, you know, federal, again, federal, just stay out of it. Stay away from it. Doesn't matter whether there's a sign or not. Just don't go there with it. Yes, sir. Yeah, first and back. Talking about post office, now, like, Lonsdale, when you've got to, you know, drop off your mail to the mailbox, you got to pull it on the street, and in order to get out, you got to go through the parking lot. Now, you mean I can't park on the parking lot and put my gun away before I go out the mailbox? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, 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 yeah, if you're driving out to federal property and get caught, it's going to be a problem. On the street, you can keep the gun in the car and walk up to the mailbox. That's fine. That's fine. See, I, I know it sounds silly, but like, like, like we said at the beginning, all these levels of rules, it, it sounds silly, but yes, the better course of action would be stay with the gun in the car on the street and walk in. Because if you do drive into federal property to drop off your mail, Put something in the uh, the mailbox, whatever it is, you're gonna have a problem. If so. Yeah, I know, I know. So all like, these years, I think it's illegal. Like, don't tell me. <laughs> <you. laughs> yeah. Quick question: I do lawn care landscaping, stuff like that. So lawn people is private property all the time. For carrying on that, what is there an issue with that at all? Because I'm on. No issue with that property. unless the uh, homeowner has a sign that says nowhere on my property. Okay. And, and that's like your easiest example of how it wouldn't be a huge deal. Like say all of a sudden you're taking care of uh, somebody's, they have a large spread of pop property that you have to take care of. Say it's literally five acres that you have to mow and truck, whatever it needs to do, and you don't see the sign because there's too much going on. And you go there, that happens, that's going to be a petty mistake. A petty mistake. It's not even a crime. It's not even like a crime. Like, it's the lowest level. Thing. Yeah. It's like a speeding ticket. Right. So, you're so not that should be at a, a felony for that. Yeah. How about that? Uh, I work at a chemical company. It's a secure site facility. And it says banned guns on property, not building on property. Can you still drive in? I'm going to work, drive in, pick no. up the car. No. no, if they say on all of their property, then you can't. Again, that's the appendix. It says it on the building. They don't say it out by the gate. Right. Here's what it is. It, it's property, it on the property when you walk in. All the doors. Right. Property is defined here. Property comes in three ways. Currency, money. Real property, which is the ground, uh, this table, this building, whatever it is, and then intellectual property which is totally different. So if you have some general sign that says 
This is Acme Corporation, no guns anywhere on Acme property. That's going to include the ground. That's going to include their parking lot, their garage. So it car, just says none in the building. That's different. Your car becomes their property when you drive onto it? Or? No, your car is still your property, but they have, the car is your property, but you can only go onto another person's property if you abide by their rules. Okay. It's just like if you came to my house and I said, I don't like uh, people wearing glasses. I can do that. It's my property. Um, sounds silly, but I could do that. Okay. Is there another question? I think okay, it's just a petty misdemeanor. Yeah. If you violate, so uh, just okay. real, now, realistically, you're not going to be getting a lot of trouble. No. Yeah. There you go. Stay there anyway. We have one back there and then one on the side. Back there. Somebody told me that uh, principals or superintendents can grant exceptions to permit carry holders here in the school. Is that true? Oh, that's the new legislation. That's, that's yeah. I would. I, we, can we get back to you on that? That is new. Because um, that's all coming in since school right. shootings under Trump. I don't know a lot about what actually right. has been passed. It has been taught that, that, that the head official can grant permission um, you know, for somebody to carry firearms. You know, I don't know if that's been if that's Is that in private or public schools? So in private schools, yeah, but in public schools. Well, I guess I don't know. Okay. We'll have to get back to you on that because that is changing with all of the school shootings. Uh, the only person right right now before any changes that can come and go into a school with a firearm is obviously a licensed peace officer. So, or someone that might be in favor had private support. And private schools are going to be slightly different. They will. Right. Too, so the rules are going to be completely different. Right. Gentlemen there? We had this debate at a previous employer about um, one of the statutes is stating that an employer may not prevent the lawful possession of a firearm in a parking lot or parking structure. So now how can they prevent you from having your car to show the work? Because they could put up a sign that says on their property they don't allow firearms. If it's their property, they can do that. They can't penalize you for having a permit to carry. I mean, that's your absolute, that is your right. They can't penalize you for possessing firearms. That is your right. But when you go onto someone's property, they can say, we don't want whatever conduct this is or whatever it is. They can say that. As long as it's not for... And this gets into a different area. It can't be for a reason that violates civil rights. For instance, they couldn't say this property is only for white people or black people or Christians or Jews. Or They can't say that. Other than that, they can say what they want. Mm -hmm. So what are the... Um, let's go to the violations. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. So next one? Yeah, I got it. Yeah. So what is it? So a violation, if you say, uh, let's go back to the transportation because we had some questions on that. If you improperly have your firearm in the vehicle, you get pulled over, um, what you're going to have is a misdemeanor. However, what happens then is if a person who's not, has a permit, say all of a sudden you have a permit to carry or otherwise, um, if you are under any type of influence of a controlled substance or alcohol, that gets you into trouble, okay? And here's the difference. You can see here that it's .10. That's the one area of the law that hasn't been changed to .08. Everything else is .08. I'm sure one day the legislature will change this to .08, but right now it's still a .10. People will ask us, well, why is it .08? That's the limit for driving a car, but it's .10 for possession of a gun. So the reason is, is that uh, many times through the legislative process, when certain laws are changed that affect other laws, years go by before those other laws also are in line. I mean, that's basically the only reason. I just have something to add to. Mm -hmm. Even though it's just a misdemeanor to um, violate the, the carry laws, I mean, if you have a gun out on your seat where a cop can see it, you're going to get your car searched. Okay, bottom line, it can lead to more stuff. I have a client, um, he, he had a gun that the cop could see just by his, his driver's seat, ended up getting his car searched. Now he's being charged with a first degree possession and going to probably go to prison for it. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's more issues beyond just what you could be charged with. Don't be stupid. You're going to get your car searched if you have your weapon just out. So, mm -hmm. bottom line. Next slide. Yeah. Okay. 
So, um, we get questions about this because many times people who have been arrested for DWI, the prosecutor will also add a charge of having a firearm uh, while you're under the influence. And um, here's, the, here's the bottom line with this. If you think that you're you know, going to go out for drinks, it's after work, not that you're intentionally going to get a DWI or anything like that, but if you know you're going to be drinking, whatever's going on after work, um, it's a really good idea uh, to have the firearm somewhere else because if you do get a DWI, uh, they might try to throw this on you too. And what it says here, what is a subsequent violation? Well, if all of a sudden it happens to you once and you get a misdemeanor, if it happens to you again, the, the level of punishment goes up to a gross misdemeanor. And levels of punishment in Minnesota are the following. If a petty misdemeanor is only up to a $300 fine. There's no jail time with it. It's not considered criminal. A misdemeanor means a judge could give you up to 90 days or $1,000 in fines. A gross misdemeanor, a judge can give you up to one year, not a year and a day, one year, and $3,000 in fines. And felonies, obviously, can be up to life, and there's no, there's no cap on any fines uh, for the serious ones. For the lesser ones, there are. So what will happen then, though, is you will also get your permit to carry revoked for either 180 days or a year. Um, and sometimes... Sometimes people will try to do this on their own, where they'll be like, you know what, I just want this gone, prosecutor's offering me a careless driving, plea to a careless, plea to this misdemeanor for violating this law, no big deal, I'm not going to jail, I pay 500 bucks, move on, that's it. And then we get a call, why is my uh, permit to carry revoked? Well, uh, you pled guilty to this. Well, they didn't tell me when I was pleading guilty. Well, they don't have to tell you everything, they really don't. Um, that's why you should have someone guiding you through the process to say, here are the consequences if you take this plea bargain or if you get convicted of this. People expect that a judge or a prosecutor will say, here are all the consequences that could happen if you uh, get a conviction for whatever it is. They don't have to advise you of any of that. The only thing that they now advise people of is a conviction, depending upon what type it is, may result in your deportation or ability to become a citizen. Other than that, they don't have to tell you anything. Okay. Uh, Major practice. And hopefully, I mean, seriously, hopefully the only times you will ever talk to us is if you have a question. Hopefully you'll never have to call us for any problems. But here's what happens with firearms, and this is probably the most serious area. We get a number of these types of cases where somebody is driving, they have a permit to carry, they get into a uh, situation on the road, angers flare, cars are pulled over. Um, and let's just take guys. Guys come out and somebody has, you know, somebody has a firearm and they flash it. Or they go, whoa, 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 something like that. Okay. Well, at a minimum, when the police get involved, they're going to investigate you for terroristic threats. Terroristic threats has nothing to do with terrorism. It was a statute that was originally uh, passed in 1968 during the Vietnam War for uh, protesters who threatened to bomb movie theaters. It has nothing to do with terrorism. The terroristic threats means that you put someone else in great fear, such as, you know, if you said, I'm going to slit your throat, you, know, you can tell. But it's also used for if somebody flashes the firearm, okay? So at a minimum, they're going to investigate you for that. I'm not saying that they're going to charge you, but they're going to investigate you for that. If you pull it out and keep it at your side, okay, guarantee they're going to investigate you for second degree assault, which is placing someone in fear, great fear, with the firearm or a knife. But we'll put knives aside. And the problem with that is a second degree assault automatically carries three years in prison. It's a mandatory minimum of 36 months. You want to know why you get insurance. <laughs> so this yeah. is the area that, other than the area of where can I carry my firearm or how to properly transport it in a motor vehicle, unfortunately the biggest area that we have is clients getting involved in this because 
somebody will always say to us, well, uh, boy, it was off 169, it was 2 a.m., I wasn't drinking, I think they were, he's flipping me, the, saying all this stuff, we pulled over, next thing I know, he's a bigger guy, he comes out, looks like he's loaded for bear, and so that's why I pulled it out and just put it on my side. Okay, the officer is going to ask you, did he say he was going to do anything to you? No. Uh, did he have a firearm? No. Uh, did he come right in your face? No. Did he say, I'm going to kick you up, whatever? No. I just felt that I had fear. Um, that's going to be a tough one. We see some of those cases charged, some not charged. We see a lot of concealed carry holders getting charged with this crime. Right. Okay. Um, I have a guy right now who's charged with a second degree assault. Late at night, he had his weapon on him. His girlfriend gets home. They get into a fight. She tells the cops he went for the gun. Okay? She, no, no injuries, nothing like that. But this guy is facing a three-year prison commit for, for that situation. And he helped himself get into it by carrying his gun when they were both drinking. Okay, but these two go hand in hand for us. Um, having a concealed carry and getting charged with a second degree assault. So it's important to be careful of the circumstances that you put yourself in when you're carrying your weapon. The other thing, oh, I'm sorry. How does that work if at 3 o'clock in the morning you got two guys banging on your door and you go answer the door and you got a gun in your hand? That's a great question and that's something I was going to get to about what's called duty to retreat. When you are out of your home, you're on the street, you do have a duty to retreat if it's reasonably, if it's reasonable, reasonable in the situation. So what does that mean? That means if it's me and another guy and I have my gun and I think he's going to do something, I have a duty to try to get out of that situation. Like, no, no, just stop, let's go our ways. That's the duty to retreat. The duty to retreat does not exist in your home. What happens in your home is what's called reasonable force. Therefore, if somebody is trying to get into your house and they're breaking down the door and you say, stop, 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 you have the gun, they ain't stopping, they know you have the gun, you can use force. If they break into your home and they just stand there and you say, get the hell out, and then they just start walking and, you know, start maybe going for the door and you shoot them in the back, you're going to be charged. And Minnesota okay. doesn't have a stand your ground law. We don't. Okay, if you're out in public, if you're not defending your home, there's a duty to retreat. And that's going to cut into self defense claims for these. Self defense claims have to be reasonable, and the judge is going to keep in mind that there is a duty to retreat first. So, mm -hmm. what happens if you're with your family? You mean if you're by yourself, you can retreat, but you're not going to retreat and leave them behind? Then it's not reasonable to retreat. Because yeah. here's what if all of a sudden, you get in that situation and you got your wife and two kids in the car and the, this guy is really causing a problem. He gets out, he's coming right up to you and, and you say, stand back, stand back, stand back, and he keeps coming at you. Now, where can you retreat? Because it's not reasonable. You have other people in the car that could be harmed by this person, okay? That's not reasonable. And I know this is really a gray area, but it's, let me give you a reasonable one, even though this, there were some protests about it, but this was reasonable. About four years ago, a gentleman on East River Road in St. Paul, um, you know, middle-aged guy, probably my age, 54, 55, with his wife, walking on the River Road in St. Paul. And three young males uh, came up to him, one and his wife, one pulled a gun, his name, I forget the juvenile's name, made big news at the time, and the, the kid pulled the gun. The gentleman had a permit to carry, was trained with firearms, he was faster than the kid, shot the kid, dead, goes down, he immediately starts doing CPR on the kid, the wife calls 911. Not even a charge in that case. That is your quintessential, quintessential example of how your duty to retreat would not be reasonable because the other person had a firearm and if you turned your back on him, he could shoot you or shoot your wife or your son or whatever it is. That is the best example. When that case was investigated by the police, uh, the victim, well, the, the gentleman, the middle-aged guy, uh, was not charged, was not put in jail. That is your best example. It's an unfortunate situation, of course, but that is your best example of how 
A duty to retreat there does not include insanity by all of a sudden <laughs> turning around and putting your back to the yeah, If someone pulls a gun yeah. on you, you yeah. don't have a duty That's to retreat. That's right. So. Mm -hmm. um, back to the home issue. Um, I don't want to have a back door, but I've had this argument or discussion with other folks. Uh, I have a friend who insists that if you have a duty to retreat in Minnesota in your own home, if you have a back door, no, no, you don't have you're not to retreat. It, it all goes to it all goes to reasonable force. Here's not reasonable force. I think we could all recall a few years ago uh, the guy up in uh, Little Falls. Yeah, Little Falls who guy. Had the, yeah, the two uh, the, kids break in. Yeah, the kids break in. He was lying in wait because his house has been burglarized before. Waits till the kid walks down first, plugs the. Male, then hits the girl. The girl's um, trying to run away yeah. from him. She That's hasn't it. done anything, no weapons, and yeah. he plugs her like four yeah. times. And the attorney who represented him is uh, Steve, who's That's two uh, yeah. two floors below us in our building. We know him really well. That was <laughs> going to be the most difficult case in the world. I mean, if you can't, you better try to work out a deal because he was convicted. So even though you have the right to protect your home. Remember, on the street, duty to retreat. In your home, reasonable force. <laughs> reasonable force for all of a sudden the kid's coming in your basement. If the kid all of a sudden now is starting to attack you, yeah, you can shoot. If there's no attack, you're just lying there, and as soon as he takes a step in the basement, you shoot him, not reasonable. There was a... Yeah, yeah. What, so what if they just flash at you, but they're not actually forward? You mean on the roadway? Yeah, on parking lot. Oh, if all of a sudden a gun comes out and they point it at you, you have right to self defense. It's just what? like flashes as like I've got a gun. You're oh. getting to a gray area. I would still say that it, you still. If all of a sudden all he did was this, then you should call the police. If he does this and it looks like he's reaching for it, absolutely have right to your face. If he what? He's. I mean, he's like this and flashes it. You could use that. It's not reasonable to retreat. You can. Um, if it's a distance, it's different. When somebody is right about to get right close to you and about to attack you, you can't retreat. That's why the law, even though there is a duty to retreat when you're outside of your home, there is a reasonableness factor because if it's not, if you can't retreat without endangering yourself, then you could use self-defense. Um, not to just. Uh, I don't want to bring into what you're doing here, but we got about 15 minutes left. Oh, right. sure. Okay, so sure. Where, where okay. I was going to go with this is, I don't know if you, you, know, you would want to maybe give us some examples of some people that honestly, truly, um, you know, did a good thing, you defended them, you helped them out, and maybe you just hit on a little bit of what that might cost somebody. Oh, you sure. Know, if they try to carry um, that bill on their shelf. Yeah, the oh. most recent example that I, we have examples of, most re and we can't give you people's names, but the most recent example that I had was I had a young man uh, he belonged in the carpentry union. He lived out in the Delano area in Wright County. He was working in Minneapolis. He had a permit to carry. Very nice kid. He's about 27, 28, married, uh, one young child. And um, he, after work on a Friday, he, he had his permit to carry and he used it because some of the places, he had to perform construction work in certain areas that weren't the safest areas. And so, um, and he was drinking after work on a Friday, got into a scrape with someone else, pulled out his gun like this, didn't point it, but pulled it out. He was in jail for three days by the time we can get him bailed out. Thank God we got all charges dismissed except for harassment charge because we didn't want him to permanently lose his uh, rights to a firearm because obviously he still wanted to hunt in the future. Um, and that was a tough case. And something like that, it depends upon the situation, but if you're charged with second degree assault, that could easily cost $15,000. Um, you're gonna be in court a lot. Mm -hmm. I sorry. have a recent case where a um, guy was out with his friend, they're in a parking lot near his car, stranger comes up, starts getting into it, starts back and forth with words, stranger swings at my client, client starts beating them, tries to walk away, guy goes back to his car, gets a knife, my guy goes to his car and gets his gun because he's a concealed pet carry. So he shoots it up in the air, guy keeps coming at him with the knife, shoots it up in the air two more times, guy keeps coming at him with the knife, points the gun, guy finally leaves. So he was in jail for 36 hours, then released, no charges. 
So it's just it's that's that was reasonable under the circumstances. What did that? Did, did you guys defend him? Um, I'm in the process of just making sure everything is copacetic and he still that's, doesn't get. Charged. I think what you're asking is yeah. if you're if you're just if just in the jail, but if you are arrested. <laughs> And it looks like they're investigating you. Many times they will say, okay, your 36 hours is up. Because under the law, if you're arrested, you have to be brought before a judge within 36 hours of your arrest, excluding the day you're arrested, Sundays and holidays. Or if the judge gives an extension of time. So if you get arrested, if it's Friday, say you went out Thursday night, and Friday at 12.05 a.m., you're arrested. You're not going to get out of the, on a serious crime. You're not going to get out of the jail till probably Monday. Friday doesn't count because you were arrested on that day. Saturday counts, but that's only 24 hours. Sunday does not count. Monday counts for the half day. So something like that where we're just investigating the situation is usually three to five thousand dollars because we gotta go through the whole process with the county attorney's office if they were charged. Yeah. Talk about the I know it sounds like that was a duty to retreat case, but they're not charging it. There's a lot of gray area in what gets charged. That was an example of that because he should have just left. He didn't, and he's still not getting charged. Another question is in your house, if somebody breaks in, you're not covered. You need to take a weapon. But they're still coming after you tell the baby, but you're coming after you with no weapons, you still have the right to shoot them. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because what happens is, again, it has to be reasonable force. If this person is about to attack you, you know, say all of a sudden your your 12-year-old daughter or son is behind you, you're like, you got to get out of here, man, and he keeps charging at you, you're going to be, yes, yeah, you can use it. Well, this, I'll get into this just for a minute, and this gets into a very, very good area, which is, we could even do another uh, session on this, which is statements to the police. Okay. When you are arrested, if you decide to give a statement to the police, make sure it's a good statement, because here's what happens. Somebody's arrested saying, oh, this, this guy, he did this, he was flipping me off, he said bad words to me, all this kind of stuff. Then they come to our office, they say, well, why am I being charged? Because you didn't say the magic words. You I got arrested. You should life. have said, I was afraid for my life. He was about to attack me. Yeah. I used the force that was reasonable to stop it. You make a statement like that, it's a way better chance for us to get a And my client in the case that wasn't charged made those statements. So you got key words you need to use. Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't make a statement without an attorney. That's exactly that's <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> that's an emergency. I do not consent to any searches. Yeah. That's right. There you go. That's like I preface it. If you decide to make a statement, our advice is always: you don't say anything until you get to an attorney. Absolutely. That's the thing I thought about because if the guy breaks in, no weapon, you shoot him, you kill him. Now it's your word, and then the police do an investigation. He has no weapons on him. Right. How do they know that I just didn't go and shoot this guy? That's right. That's right. But here's what happens if. Say all of a sudden you get an attorney involved pretty quickly. They arrest you, you say, that's it, i got to call my buddy, friend, or whoever it is. And the attorney comes visit you because we have to have access to a client, even if you're not an actual client at the time. If you call us and say, hey, I'm in the Goodhue County Jail, they're saying I did this. We're there in like yeah, an hour. Yeah, we, they have to allow us to have access to you. Now, all of a sudden, you tell us what happened. This is powerful stuff. Then we can say, a day, two days, two weeks later, hey, investigator, Mr. Investigator, prosecutor, our client wants to now give a statement. We, we want to tell you what happened. Uh, I did that on the case where I represented a, actually a part-time peace officer down in um, Albert Lee. Um, and so we wanted to give a statement. Because then, if the prosecutor or the investigator says, well, we're not interested in your statement, that was horrible to a jury. Most of the time, they will say, yeah, we'll take a statement from you now. And that's what happens. That's what, but if you, you, yes, of course, you shouldn't give a statement, but we can't tell you exactly what to do. But if you decide to give a statement, make sure it has the magical words, or else oh, it could be trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or I was scared for my life. Do you I want us to I stop? Or or probably, probably going to wrap up. Okay, oh, okay. that's fine. Are you getting any last thing before I close you guys out? No, we can do, do you guys have any last questions? Yeah. I just, 
<laughs> you guys are all saying, like, you guys are big. What about somebody my size? Oh, yeah. Like, if someone came yeah, in my I house and I get shot up, I'm sure. not going to get charged. No, okay? Right. I weigh 110 pounds. So but here's, the, here's the thing, folks. If you guys, you know, if you take a class, a concealed carry class, we'll beat these to death. Yeah. You got all the time in the world, you know, to ask these questions, and we'll answer them. So, you know, I mean, just take a class. Even if even if you don't think you're at the point where you're ready to carry, take a class, because knowledge is power, and I'll answer those questions for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. So. And here, if anybody, this is our contact info. We can leave it up for a second. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this phone number right here, 612-341-4570, that is a 24-hour-a-day, seven days a week, 365-day-a-year number. You do not get an answering service. Uh, our firm has seven attorneys, and what we do is we, and then we have staff members, and so what we do is somebody in our office, whether it's New Year's Eve, Christmas Day, Easter Sunday, it doesn't matter, somebody is always online, you will not get an answering service. And then that's our uh, emails. So we're going we're gonna to go ahead and close them out right now. I just want to tell you, they didn't ask for a dime. These guys are here for you. And, you know, uh, they, they got the 24-hour number. They're a great resource. But just under, understand, there's, there's two things that can happen here. One, you get yourself in, in, in tight water, and you can call their 1-800 number. You're footing the bill. You know, after we get up and have Golden's presentation, understand you're getting the same two masterminds here, but Golden's going to cover 100% of that bill. No cost, no questions, no nothing, unlimited resources for them and all their resources, expert witnesses, labs, whatever they need at no cost. So just understand there's a, you know, there's a picture here at the end of the day because we'll end up talking to you about how this relationship works with the Gun Owners Legal Defense Network.